Okay, so today we are very happy to have uh, Joaquin Turiaci from uh, University of Washington, and he will tell us about gravitational index of the heterotic string. Yeah, yeah thank you very much for the invitation. It's very nice to, to be here. And I will be telling you about this paper we wrote with Yiming Chen, that is a postdoc and, at uh, Stanford, and Samir Murthy. <clears throat> um, so let me begin with some general comments. So over the last decades, maybe we learned that in string theory, at least black holes as seen from the outside behave as ordinary quantum systems. And we can ask what are the implications of these principles for the theory of quantum gravity. Uh, an example of this is ADS CFT, where the, the ADS is the near horizon geometry of a big black hole. Um, but I, what are the rules in the bulk? That's what we want to understand. We don't really have an independent definition of the bulk. String theory is not as we understand it, good enough to tell us what that is. Um, so we would like to understand this better. Uh, so far, the most successful approach has been the gravitational path integral from the bulk perspective. Started by Gibbons and Hawking, but it took different forms in the last years. And this is an approach that can be used to compute microscopic properties of the black hole microstates using the black hole geometry. And well, it has been used for a lot of things, like recently to evaluate the page curve of the entropy of Hawking radiation, to get the uh, things like the entanglement entropy of subregion in the CFT, and every time it has been applied, it has provided um, answers consistent with this principle, black holes being ordinary quantum systems. So the purpose of this talk is to find some setup where we can address, or at least start to address the question of how does this gravitational path integral that is clearly defined in terms of the low energy data of the theory, how does it emerge from conventional string theory? Um, so I will try to tell you about the system that has what I believe to be the right features to, to explore this question. OK, so let me tell you a summary about heterotic string states. Uh, um, so consider the fundamental heterotic string compact five on D5 crosses one um, down to four dimensions that has momentum N and Y in W around the circle. So this is DS1. And then there's a five-dimensional torus you can forget about. And from the point of view of the four-dimensional space, this is a point excit point excitation with some charges. Uh, the mass of the heterotic string um, depends on the momentum unwinding, or in other words, it depends on the right and left moving momentum that I denote by Q left and Q right. And it also depends on the excitation number, LR and L at left, of the right or left moving oscillations. And this is a picture that is clear at, at weak coupling, of course. Um, out of all these states, there are special ones studied, I think, first by Dabolkar and Harvey, where these strings are VPS and preserve some supersymmetry. And this happens when the right moving sector has the, the excitations turned off. And there, in my convention, the right moving sector is the one that carries the supersymmetry, of course. Um, so these states are supersymmetric for any left moving excitation. They have a mass fixed in terms of the right moving momentum. And the left moving excitation has to be matched by um, level matching condition to the, um, to the product of momentum unwinding by this relation, this relation here. And this, of course, guarantees that the mass, that you get the same expression for the mass, whatever, um, whether you see it from the right moving point of view or the moving. OK, so how many of these BPS strings are there? So a weak coupling, we can count them easily. It's just the number of left moving excitations. So if you introduce a chemical potential tau that couples to, to the product of N and W, then the answer is simply this one over the Dedekind function to the power 24. This is just the 24 excitations you can have on the left movers. Um, the number of these states at fixed charges is just the Fourier transform, this D of N that I defined there. And as you all know, you can, well, you can do a simple saddle point estimation of how this density, how this degeneracy grows with the charges. And the number of these BPS states grows exponentially with four pi times the square root of N times W. My conventions were. 
we're taking n times w to be very large. So we have an, this four dimensional, let's say, charged particles with a very large degeneracy when they are BPS. Um, this quantity is also equal to the index <clears throat> where we weight bosonic and fermionic states with a different sign. And the advantage of considering the index is that this can be extrapolated to strong coupling, strong string coupling, um, something we cannot do with the degeneracy. OK, so I introduced these states of weak coupling. Now we want to turn on the coupling and ask, what is the gravitational description of these fundamental string states? Um, so for excited states, the string, as we turn on the coupling, is believed to collapse and form a black hole. That's indicated by that diagram. Um, but the question is, can we reproduce the last degeneracy of BPS states from the black hole picture? I mean, ideally, we would like to do it also for the non-BPS one. But for the, the, the reason why we will focus on the BPS states is because we can extrapolate their index to strong couplings. As I said, we cannot do otherwise. Um, but if you try to do this, you run into a problem that is that the BPS limit of the geometries that are sourced by these string charge are, are singular. They have a horizon with essentially zero area. So they have a curvature singularity there, and then, well, uh, the two derivative approximation behind these black hole solutions breaks down. I will review that briefly later. So, uh, so far, there are what I consider to be two contradicting pictures that resolve the singularity, and resolving this tension would be the point of the rest of the talk. On one hand, we have, well, the more recent proposal by Chen, Maldacena, and Witten from 2021 that says that, well, let's say you start with excited string states that collapse to the black hole, and then you lower the mass until you reach the VPS mass. And their argument is that as you lower the mass, when the black hole becomes a string size, there is a transition of the same, of the, of the same type as the horowitz polchinski one that I will review later. And the geometric picture of the of the system is not that of a black hole at the extremity, is, is a string gas. That's what they propose. And <clears throat> uh, on the other hand, there has been a different proposal by, um, by Sen, even in the 90s, this one is older, and, and then made more precise by Davokar. And other people, where the, where the black hole becomes string size before it reaches the extreme, extremity where it's singular, and then higher derivative corrections stabilize the size of the horizon to some small string size black hole. Um, these two proposals give the right answer for the general CS extremality, but I, I want to emphasize that, that I mean, we have, a, we have two answers to one question that are very different. So that's, uh, if, so that's a problem. I mean, it's uh, two contradicting answers. It's as good as no answer in a way. Um, so what we want to do is to make sense of this, of this uh, situation. What, which, which solution is correct? What is the gravitational description of these extremal BPS states, really? Is it a, a string gas or is it a small black hole? Okay. Uh, maybe before I continue, is the motivation clearly, clearly clear? Okay. So when you say string gas, is this like just a highly excited string or, or like kind of I mean, many strings. I mean, it's, it's, you mean this is... It's is the highly excited one. But first, well, yeah. Yeah, this is the highly excited one. And I also mean, well, I will say that later, but also it doesn't go uh, straight to the string gas. There is an intermediate region with a self-gravitating string. Mm -hmm. um, that's what they, they propose. Yeah. Sorry, when you said that in the BPS limit, the black hole has zero area. Yeah. yeah. But does not apply for that black hole. It would solve this. Zero area to the derivative approximation. Okay. So here they say you should include higher derivatives, and then you have a black hole with a small area. And this solves the problem. Yeah, they compute the entropy of this small black hole, and it matches with the um, with the this entropy of the BPS strings states. Uh, but yeah, so but, but just to emphasize, these two pictures are different. So either one is correct, or the two are. I don't know, equivalent in some way, but that seems very unlikely. Okay. Okay. So let me review a little bit this, this 
to charge black hole in four bits. So the heterotic string compactified on T6 can be described by n equals four supergravity. The bosonic constant content is symmetric, a dilaton phi, a B field, 28 gauge fields, and generic point in model space, and it's a matrix of 28 by 28 with some constraint of scalar fields that are the model that <clears throat> from the geometry of the torus and also from the Wilson and the gauge fields in And uh, the 28 electric charges are related to the left and right moving momentum of the string in the way that I described here. So if you enumerate them in some way that I guess I'm not giving the details, but but 22 of them correspond to this vector of the moving momentum in the in in one circle inside the T6 and the right moving one. So we need to find black hole solutions with all these charges in 4D. And this problem, is, problem was solved by SEM using something called the solution generating technique. So roughly, this is a picture of what, what he does. <clears throat> um, so this low energy supergravity theory that arises from the heterotic string has a big symmetry group of, it's actually, well, it's 06, 22. That's the T-duality symmetry. Um, when you compactify on T6. But if you have a black hole geometry that has a time translation invariance, and you're thinking of a, a black hole in equilibrium, then your symmetry group is actually bigger. It's 0723. In a sense, you can think of that extra circle as being the time circle that you can compactify the heterotic string of on one more circle. And the duality of this bigger group can generate a charged solution from an uncharged one. So you can start with the Schwarzschild black hole in, in 4D, apply this duality transformation, and end up with a electrically charged black holes with, with some mass and left and right moving momentum. So this is how the solution looks like for vanishing left moving momentum, or equivalently when n is equal to W, that's just a case where the solution becomes simpler. Um, so you can see this is very similar to, I don't know, it's like a more complicated version of the rise and Nordstrom black hole. You have some radial dependence uh, GTT and GRR, and some radially dependent dilaton. Um, omega are the angular directions. Um, the event horizon is located at, at the radius where the denominator in the radial component vanishes, and is given by, by this expression. Um, as a check, you can see that if the mass is very big, then this reduces to the Schwarzschild solution. So here you have 2m. Um, but when you approach the VPS limit, where m squared is equal to qr squared over 2, precisely the thing that appears in the numerator, then this r plus becomes 0. Um, and this is the first sign of a, of a problem at extremality. Another problem is that the dilaton approaches a minimal value of the horizon. Well, sorry, that's not the problem, that's just a feature. In general, the dilaton approaches the minimal value of the horizon, where R, R is the, uh, takes the smallest value. <laughs> I'm thinking here about the, the Euclidean section to compute the, the free energy, let's say. Um, or later, the index. Um, and this is the value it takes at the horizon. But again, we see at that the extremality, um, this quantity vanishes, so the dilaton blows up. Not only the area becomes zero, but the dilaton is also blowing up at the horizon as we approach experimental. And finally, something even more weird that um, is also a signature that the solution is singular is that the Hawking temperature is equal to 1 over 8 pi m. This is the same as the Schwarzschild expression, but it's still true regardless of the charge. And when you approach, ex approach extremality, this m is a function of the charges that I wrote here, but it's different from zero. And it should be clear that, that if you have an extremal solution with a non-zero temperature, there is something similar going on. OK. So roughly, this is how the thermodynamics of the system looks like. As you raise the temperature, um, uh, so the, the mass of the black hole is very high at low temperatures. And as you raise the temperature, the mass approaches extremality. So the, the fact that the, the mass decreases as you raise the temperature is just the fact that these black holes are unstable. Even the Schwarzschild black hole is unstable in that space. Um, the entropy is also going down as you raise the temperature until you keep, which in both cases, this T max is the extreme temperature I wrote down before. 
And this dash line are the regions where you cannot trust the solution anymore because the curvatures became stringy near the horizon. So are there other contributions to the gravitational path integral as we approach extremality that might be relevant for reproducing this uh, the generality of these BPS states? <clears throat> um, so the one I want to describe is this self gravitating string that Chen Maldasen and Witten study. Um, it's based on a well, I guess originally it was introduced by Korowitz and Polchinski, um, who found the gravity solution with a non-trivial winding condensate and interpreted it as a self gravitating string. Um, the idea is the following. So consider a thermal ensemble. In a thermal ensemble, you are compactifying your theory on the thermal circle. So think of it as a, um, some effective theory in three dimensions. So the time was compactified. Then when you are close to the Hagedorn temperature, which means some particular choice of length of the thermal circle, then there is a mode that has winding one around that circle that becomes very light. And that was understood in the 80s, long time ago. So what Horowitz and Polchinski did was to take an effective theory where you, the metric is flat, but you keep track of the, um, this winding condensate, this field chi I call here, um, which you cannot ignore because if you are very close to Hagedorn, it's very light. And also let the circle, the length of the thermal circle fluctuate by introducing this field phi. Um, so truncate the theory to just these two degrees of freedom, the winding condensates and the and the size of the of the circle. And then is there a solution where this winding field is not vanishing in some region of space and goes to zero at infinity? And then that region will be interpreted as the place where the same gravitating string is. Um, just to show you a picture, so this is roughly how their solution looks like. Far away, you just have flat space times a circle because you're in the thermal ensemble. So phi is zero, meaning that the, the length is approximately beta. And then as you go close to the string, you have a, a, a region of some size where the winding mode takes a non-zero value classically. And then the size of the thermal circle is also changing and it becomes slightly smaller, but always finite inside this winding condition. <clears throat> and the regular the position dependent value of this phi can be interpreted as a Newtonian potential of this self-gravitating string. Okay, so this solution is reliable close to the Hagedorn temperature where the winding mode is light. It has a classical entropy, which is an interesting feature, and that happens because the mass of the winding mode depends on the temperature. Um, it has a non-local, but well, any local action will not have any entropy, but here the action is non-local because of the fact that this winding mode is wrapped around the thermal circle. Um, and well, if, if we are too close to the uh, high level temperature, then quantum effects can become important, and then there is a transition to the free string instead of this winding condensate. Um, okay, so this is a picture of roughly the thermodynamics of of the system. This is so far. I'm reviewing what Horowitz and Polchinski did without charge. And um, this R is the, the radius of the thermal circle minus the value of Hagedorn. So the blue line is the black hole, is the, the mass of the black hole, how it goes down as, as you approach uh, the Hagedorn temperature. And then there's a transition to the uh, red line that is the curve of mass as a function of temperature of the, of the self gravitating string. OK, so in this paper of Chen Madison and Witten, they uh, use the solution generating technique to map the self gravitating string without charge to a charge version of the self gravitating string. Um, moreover, at low energies, one can argue that the ocean action of the catalytic theory is given by a boundary term only. And near the boundary, the solution is trivial in the sense that it's, it's flat and all the field takes their asymptotic value. Um, so something interesting that they do is that they they argue that one can find the thermodynamics to all orders in alpha prime using this solution generating technique. Um, and there was a nice check recently of, of their formulas, but okay, I, I won't go into too much detail because that's uh, I want to go in a different direction. Um, but anyway, the upshot is that the entropy of this charge follow is called Chisky solution when we are close to so the BPS bound is m being close to QR over square root 2. Um, it has this form. And this is precisely, if you map it, uh, OK, I didn't write it here, but if you map 
the QR and QLF to wind in a momentum, then, then this expression is exactly the same as the one you derive at a weak coupling that I presented in the beginning. Um, then this is, a, well, this is a different limit that I just wrote down to show it, but in this limit, the mass is approaching the left moving charge. So this is a, a different extremal limit that is not super symmetric, and, and that's fine that it doesn't, in that case, the, the, the entropy doesn't match the, the one of the VP states, but that's fine, you didn't have to. Um, okay. Well, I know these are some properties of the solutions, but maybe I will skip it. So if we set up the gravitational path integral that computes the, the free energy of these strings, then <clears throat> at high temperatures, or at, at, for away from externality, we have this black hole geometry where we have a thermal circle that contracts at the horizon. And as we lower the mass, then we have a, a solution with a different topology. So it's kind of like a, well, it's kind of like a Hawking plate transition in the sense that it's a change of topology, but but it is different in the sense that the proposal of Horowitz and Kochinsky and Chen Malasina Witten is that there is no phase transition. That these two geometries are uh, continuously connected as world should see of this. But the topology is different because here the thermal circle is always non vanishing and, and it just changes the size a little bit where the, the string is located. Okay, so the conclusion roughly of this of their picture is that. Well, if we look at the thermodynamics, we have the blue line that is the two charge black hole. And then when we, when we get to this region where the stringy effects become large, there is a transition uh, to this uh, uh, winding condensate or to this string gas. Um, and then it has a more normal also thermodynamic behavior where as you approach extremality, the temperature starts going back down to zero as it should. Uh, and also the entropy instead of going all the way to zero, is, Stops decaying and should transition to the self irritating string that <clears throat> um, at the extremity reaches, uh, well, this value one is S, X is the, the one predicted from the weak coupling uh, string theory calculation. So, so I missed your comment before. Is there a transition? Uh, no, the, the, the proposal is that there is no transition, uh, no, that there is a no, no phase transition, that they are continuously connected as. What should CFTs? That's the. Yeah, I, I would just say mis, may, making that comment because if you see this picture, it looks kind of like talking phase transition. Yeah. But just wanted to emphasize that it's not a phase transition in the sense that there is no it's believed to be no discontinuity. Um, yeah, actually, another point of the paper is to use the index of the worksheet CFT to try to argue that whether that's possible or not. <clears throat> and in the case of type two string, they find that. There is a mismatch between the index of the world sheet CFT in this phase and this phase. So then in type two, there has to be a phase transition. But in the heterotic string, whatever you evaluate that is protective in both phases give you the same answer. So at, at least there is no, um, no, uh, no argument against them being continuously connected. <laughs> they cannot rule it out. Okay. Okay, if there is no more questions, then let me continue. So I will explain how to compute the gravitational index of the heterotic string. By gravitational index, I mean using the gravitational path integral to compute the index. In analogy with how some people refer to gravitational entropy. And this is based on, well, the, 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 the paper we wrote. And there was also a, another paper that for the previous week by Ashok Sen and collaborators. So to evaluate the index, we need to implement the insertion of minus one to the F in the gravitational path integral. So how can we make fermions periodic um, in the black hole solution around the thermal circle? So naively, if you just declare that to take the same black hole but with periodic fermions, you'll see that that gives you a singular spin structure because, well, the thermal circle will contract at the horizon and you cannot put fermions in that geometry with those boundary conditions. So the solution, um, was originally introduced in ADS and, and then in flat space. Um, the solution is to add rotation. So if you add, uh, let's say, an angular velocity far away, in, um, I mean, at the boundary of your space time, what that tells you is that as you go around the thermal, thermal, thermal circle, you also need to rotate 
an angle uh, specified by the angular velocity. That's one way of, of saying that you have an angular velocity. You go around the thermal circle and you, and you rotate. <clears throat> so that's that's the representing the blue line here. And this circle is the one that contracts in the black hole in the rotating black hole geometry. And fermion should always be antiperiodic along this blue line because that's where, where that's the only consistent choice of, of boundary conditions. Fermions are also antiperiodic in this horizontal line. This is just a rotation of this angle phi, and this phi is an angle in the sphere, and because the well, this this circle from zero to two pi is contractible even at the sphere that is at the boundary, so you are forced to make that antiperiodic. Um, the idea of these papers is that if you pick the angular velocity to satisfy this constraint, such that the the shift that you produce as you go along the thermal circle is exactly two pi, <clears throat> then which I wrote here, uh, then the fermions will also be periodic around the thermal circle, which is the red line here. In the sense they're anti-periodic here, they're anti-periodic here, they're periodic in this, in this circle. Um, but then that's fine. This is not inconsistent with anything because uh, the fermions are periodic around the circle that is not contracting anywhere. So there's no, no problem. So if you want to evaluate the, the, the gravitational path integral that computes the index of a black hole, you should find the rotating black hole with some angular momentum consistent with this choice of angular velocity. Um, another way to think about it that I did write down is that minus y to the f is like e to the two pi ij. Because if you have half integer spin, you have that gives you a minus one. If spin is integer, it gives you a plus one. So you can think of an insertion of e to the two pi ij as, as a choice of angular velocity. So let me remind you how this works for Rice and Nordstrom. So the solutions are labeled by by a mass, a charge, and the rotational parameter A, that is the spin over the mass. Um, take this rotational parameter to be machinary because we're going to choose the, the angular velocity to be machinary. And if you put it into the, 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 the solution of Carl Newman solution, you'll get that the location at the horizon, R plus, is equal to Q plus A. Uh, beta is a function of, of Q and A. And the mass will be equal to Q regardless of beta. So for a choice of temperature, I can pick the value of this rotational parameter to solve this equation and make the geometry smooth. So what I fix at the boundary is the temperature and the charge and, and the angular velocity. And then the, the, the angular momentum given through A will be fixed by smoothness. And for all these solutions, no matter what the value of A is, M is always equal to Q, which is what you need for, uh, for supersymmetry. Um, the solution has an on-chill action that is independent of temperature and it is given by, by roughly Q squared. Uh, this happens to be the extremal area of the black hole without the minus one to the F. But here, let me emphasize that this is a non-extremal finite temperature black hole. The area depends on the temperature, as you see, is Q plus A. A will be some function of temperature. So the, <clears throat> there is some nice cancellation between all the possible temperature dependence to, to give back this extremal area answer um, that you will have at zero temperature. Um, all VPS solutions can be written in, in the Israel Wilson form that I wrote here. Uh, so here we write the geometry as the thermal circle, fiber over a three-dimensional space uh, labeled by this vector x with three components. We have some emblackening factor u, and we have some vector omega that both are given in terms of two functions, h and h tilde, that are harmonic. And to reproduce the kern newman black hole with this choice of angular velocity, we need to pick these two harmonic functions to take this form where they, they have poles at xn and xs that um, are separated by a. So the, the way you can think about it is that when you add rotation, you are singling out two points in the horizon, and their separation is determined in terms of the angular momentum. If you want to reproduce the extremal black hole solution, then you take this xn and xs to be on top of each other. And if you do, you reproduce, well, this. Uh, a solution called the Machundar Papapetru is, is the usual multi-center black hole you, 
might be familiar with. Next. Well, just to describe the topology a little more. Uh, in this Israel Winsor presentation, we have this spatial plane <coughs> with the thermal circle. We have two points. And then something that I, I didn't show, but this the solution for this vector omega has a, a singularity between the two, the two points. Um, you can map it to more standard coordinates. And this was understood a long time ago by Hartland and Hawking and other people, that you can map it to the usual, um, let's say, coordinates where, where it's more manifest the fact that the topology is the thermal circle contracting at the horizon and, and the spatial circle becoming, uh, well, giving you a, a, a big area at the horizon. So the two point is north and south pole, and we call them that like that because they are mapped to the north and south pole at the horizon. And this singular line is just a coordinate singularity and it's mapped to the whole sphere at the horizon. Okay. So these are just very unconventional coordinates from the point of view of the geometry, but uh, they will be very useful for, for finding supersymmetric solutions. Um, so let's go back to the two charged black holes. So send contracted not only the charged black hole, but also a rotating charged black hole with momentum unwinding. So we can use the same duality transformation, but now our starting point will be the curved black hole instead of the Schwarzschild black hole. Um, and then applying the same one, we'll, we'll have a, a black hole with, with some mass, angular momentum, and, and electric charges. So for big black holes, meaning black holes that like the Ryzen Nordstrom that have a large area at extremality, the choice of angular velocity implies the extension of the Killing Spinner because M is always equal to Q. Uh, but that's not the case in the two charged black hole, as we will see. So let's, let's again call uh, A the imaginary part, just because it will always be imaginary anyways. And then the condition of, of implementing the minus one to the F is that beta omega is given by, by which is given by this expression is equal to one. And this little m is, is this combination. So it's something that is positive and becomes zero uh, when supersymmetry is preserved. And the only VPS solution of this, uh, of this equation is to take a fixed and send m to zero. Um, as a side comment, there are other solutions I'm not describing. So one can ask what is the the gravitational path integral that computes the trace of minus one to the F, even in theories that might not be supersymmetric. So for example, in the usual ADS-CFT, you can ask, uh, can I have a prediction of what the difference between bosonic and fermionic high energy states in the CFT are? And one can apply this principle to that problem too. Um, but in this case, we have a theory of supergravity and we're computing an index. So if you have a solution that is not supersymmetric, it's not going to contribute to the path integral because of fermion zero modes. Um, in this case, the only way of finding a solution that is supersymmetric is to, uh, again, to take this, this little n parameter to zero and keep a fixed. So I won't consider anything. OK, um, in this limit, the temperature has the same weird feature that it had before. The temperature gets fixed in terms of the charge. This is not what happened for the large black hole. For the large black hole, we had, well, let me remind you, beta had some, after we imposed the, the choice of angular velocity, beta <coughs> had some A dependence left that allows us to tune this parameter to the temperature, but now we cannot do it anymore. Our solution will have some fixed temperature in terms of the charges. And that's really weird because the temperature is a boundary condition we fix at infinity. We should be able to pick whatever we want. Um, uh, another way of pointing out the same problem is that now, because A doesn't appear in beta, it's, it's a completely undetermined free parameter of the solution. So we have a continuous family of solutions that's a bit weird. Um, but let's go ahead, let's, let's continue and we will fix this problem later. Um, before I do that, let me point out that this BPS metric takes also the Israel Wilson form where the in black and in factor is equal to the to the dilaton, uh, as I wrote here, and the dilaton is given by also a harmonic function. And again, the rotational parameter is related to the separation between the, the north and south pole. 
and the area is proportional to this rotational parameter. Um, so for example, now we have, before we had, when we compute the, the, the entropy, we had a small black hole with short term with at extremity. Now we have a BPS black hole, which is not extremal, can be large, can have a big area, but we will see that it's still singular. Um, and another feature is that the on-shell action is zero. And that's consistent with, with the microscopic expression because this growth, um, let me say it this way, if the on-shell action of the two derivative level was not zero, it will grow too fast with the charges in a way that one would not be able to reproduce the microscopic counting. Um, so we will correct this, but but this is important that, that we get zero at this at this stage. Uh, so let me remind you, uh, let me summarize the progress of the solutions. So the index can be evaluated at any temperature, but the gravity solution only exists for one. And there is a modular space parameterized by the area. In particular, it includes the area being zero. And the Einstein metric is smooth, um, but the solution is singular because the dilaton is blowing up. At, and now it will blow up only at the poles and not, not everywhere at the horizon like it did um, for the free energy. And that you can see here because maybe I should have pointed out, but this is a harmonic function that has the poles both on the north and south pole for the, for the dilator. But something good is that the string coupling is becoming zero at the poles, so, so we, should, we might be able to understand this, including. And that was the idea of this other papers that because the string coupling is small, we might be able to include higher derivative corrections to resolve the singularities. Okay, so let me um, uh, is there any question maybe for a move on? Okay, before I resolve these problems, including higher derivative corrections, I wanted to argue that these properties are quite universal in the following sense. So let's work with any N equals two supergravity theory, which we need to talk about these BPS states anyways. Um, essentially what I will argue in the next couple of slides is that these uh, unwanted features of the solution computing the gravitational index are common to any small black hole in N equals two supergravity. Okay, and it was also for gravity is a theory that has vector multiplets. In the vector multiplets, there are scalars xi that are complex. <coughs> um, the action is specified by a, at the two derivative level by a prepotential f of x. And in Calabria compactification, so string theory to four dimensions, this f of x takes some specific form where these c, c i, j, k's are, are numbers. Uh, determined in terms of the geometry of the compact space. So there are BPS solutions that were found by, by this group with four supercharges. And just like the Israel Wilson form that I described before for the Kern Newman black hole, they are specified in terms of a set of harmonic functions. So this, this index i goes from zero to nv, so we have two nv plus two harmonic functions. Um, the constant piece is determining the moduli at infinity uh, because this will determine the scalars, as I will tell you in a moment. And the coefficient of this pulse at the position A essentially tells you what is the charge in each, in each center. <clears throat> so this vector gamma is a, is a vector of magnetic and electric charge. So the metric, any supersymmetric metric has to have this form of Israel Wilson. Um, the coefficients, this blackening factor and omega and, and the scalars x are given in terms of the harmonic functions by these three equations. So this, this equation first tells us what the scalars are. So we have here x and these f's are functions of x. So we can use it to solve for, for the scalars. And then we have the blackening factor in terms of the scalars, which are in terms given by the harmonic functions and also this vector omega is determined by the harmonic functions. But in a sense, you can think of this N equals two theory as a machinery that produces BPS solutions out of these harmonic functions. And in the harmonic functions, you have the information about the boundary conditions, 
through the moduli and through the, the charges of the black hole. Okay, so let us recover the extreme attractor. This is the well, something from the 90s. This was the original application of the attractor mechanism. The way to achieve extremality for one center in this case is to pick all the harmonic functions to have the center at the same location. Um, let's call it the origin. So R is the distance from the origin. And gamma will be the vector of charges of the black hole at that center. So near the pole, the scalars blow up in a particular way. Um, this unblackening factor has a, a double pole, which is characteristic of a, a horizon with zero temperature. And this coefficient that appear here are fixed in terms of the charges by the attractor equations. So these coefficients are given by, by, this, uh, by these equations where P are the magnetic charges and Q are the electric charges. And again, these Fi's are functions of the scalar, so this uniquely determines what the scalars are. And to simplify the, the expressions, I, well, I didn't say it, but these scalars are defined projectively. So these equations are for a specific normalization that makes the equation look as simple as, as I could. <clears throat> okay. But now to compute the index, we should do it at finite temperature and we should have rotation. So that's something we did in, in a paper with with Boru, Chilieso, and Murthy from last year. Um, one thing that it requires is a simple pole in this emblackening factor. So before, for the extreme black hole, we have this emblackening factor going as one over R squared that is characteristic of a zero temperature horizon. Now we need a simple pole uh, that allows for non-zero temperature. Um, to do that, what we need to do is to take the, the same harmonic function we had before, and that single center needs to be split in two. That again will be the north and south pole. And these two charges, gamma n and gamma s, their sum has to be equal to the total charge, big gamma, um, of the original black hole. Uh, but in principle, how the total charge is distributed between these two centers is something that we find a posteriori by, by, by imposing smoothness of the geometry. Um, smoothness, of, smoothness of the geometry also imposes another condition, which is that, well, which is this. Um, so this, okay, I didn't say it before, but this comes from demanding that, that the profile of this vector omega is smooth. I can give you more details offline, but so this relates the, um, this intersection product between the, the charge vector and the north and south pole, the distance between the north and south pole, the model at infinity, which is this little h, and the temperature. So after you fix the dipole charge, which I will do in the next slide, you can use this relation to determine what the rotational parameter is, this separation, as a function of, of the, the rest of the parameters of the solution, like the moduli and charges. And finally, this solution has an area proportional to, to the rotational parameter, just like, like before for the horizon north case. case. So here, I'm kind of also repeating what I said before for, for a specific theory for n equals 2. So, so this is the case where beta depends both on also on a, right? So you Q on a is such a way that the solution is smooth. Yeah, well, we will see that. So <clears throat> this gamma n and gamma s, needs to, I will say where they come from in the next slide. But essentially, the big black holes will be black holes where this is non-zero, and the small black holes will be black holes where this coefficient vanishes. And then you won't be able to solve for a because uh, a appears in the denominator here. In that case, beta will depend only on the right charge. In the, that case, beta will depend only on the charge and the moduli. And so that's the same as I had before. So yeah, that's what I'm trying to get to, to show that any two derivative theory, if any equals to supergravity with small black holes, will have the same features. So it's not special to this quadratic uh, string. Okay, so the solution of of the following questions so of I specified everything in the solution except this type of charges, gamma n and gamma s. So the solution that determines them is, we call it the new attractor in that paper I mentioned before. Um, so the condition of finite temperature, meaning that there is a simple zero of GTT, implies that at the North Pole, H bar is zero, and at the South Pole, H is zero. We can change what we mean by North and South and uh, such that 
we would say that H north is equal to zero, but then H bar S should be equal to zero. So there is some uh, ambiguities here. So let's let's uh, yeah we 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 call the north pole the one where H bar is zero and that determines it. Um, then the stabilization equations that were this. I should write it again. There are these equations that tell you what the scalars are in terms of the harmonic functions. They tell us, yeah, they tell us that the non-zero components of the scalars are equal to their old attractor values, h star and h bar star. Um, once we know this, this determines the dipole charge uniquely as gamma n being proportional to this vector of, of uh, scalars at their attractor value. So this H star and F star, you should think of them as some function of the charge. They're what, they're what was called previously the, the attractor model. And finally, the Oshel action is given by, by I times pi times this inter intersection product between these two dipole charges. And again, this is precisely the extremal area. That's why we will see that something funny happens when this is zero. Um, so now that we know the dipole charges, everything is specified in terms of them. You can think of the solution in this way. So you have some modular at infinity, specified however you want. You have some temperature. Then you have a rotating black hole. Um, as opposed to the previous attractor mechanism, the scalars are free, or they have a profile that depends on the boundary conditions at the horizon, except only at the north and south pole of the horizon. And the north, has, north of the horizon, at the north pole of the horizon, x is fixed to the tractor and x bar to zero, and the south pole, x is zero and x bar is fixed to the tractor. Other than that, the rest of the profile in the horizon is, is undetermined unless you, you give me the boundary condition. Um, so this is different than the old attractor where the scalars would take a, a constant value everywhere in the horizon, even in terms only of the charges. Um, yeah, so all properties that we found for the two charge heterotic non extremal BPS solution are general. So, solutions with managing extremal area require that this intersection product is zero. And whenever this happens, the actual action is automatically zero. And now regularity doesn't determine this, uh, the separation between the poles. And, and I already mentioned that for a previous question. So, this, this term will vanish, and then beta will be given in terms of. Gamma n, that is some function of the charges. I'm not telling you explicitly what it is. And h, which is something you fix at, at the boundary. <laughs> um, and finally, at the poles, at the horizon, the central charge vanishes. And this is the analog of this uh, dilaton blowing up that we found before. OK, so in the last 10 minutes, I will describe what happens when we add hard derivative corrections. Um, is there any question before I <laughs> Okay. Yeah. So let me recap. We set up the problem to compute the gravitational path integral for the index of this two charge system in the heterotic theory. We find that the two derivative level, the solution is singular at the poles of the horizon. So we need to add higher derivative terms there and, and see what happens. Um, in the, we will use the formalism of n equals 2 supergravity because it's, it's very useful. And in this formalism, the action have, has two terms when you incorporate higher derivative corrections. They are what they're called, you have what they're called f terms. So these are kind of superspace integrals. And there are d terms. These are full superspace integrals. The d terms are very complicated, but the f terms are easy. Um, the f terms are given in terms of a prepotential again, just like before this function of the scalars f of x, with the difference that now it can depend also on, on another scalar a hat that is roughly like r squared, or it's a superfield that has r squared in its multiple. Um, and in principle, the prepotential can be an arbitrary function of a hat. Um, it has, can have arbitrary powers. Um, the higher the power of a hat, the higher in derivatives. It will, it will be. But something nice for the heterotic string is that in n equals 4 supergravity, there is a non-normalization theorem that tells you that, that this truncates to linear order in a hat. And you don't have to consider anything beyond that level. 
Uh, this doesn't happen in n equals two compactifications where you can have, well, this is determined in terms of the topological string and you can have more complicated X and A hat depends. Okay, so in, in an impressive series of papers, uh, this group found BPS, found all the BPS configurations with four supercharges in the presence of arbitrary F terms. <clears throat> um, so our analysis will be valid under the assumption that the D terms, which I told you in the previous slide, don't make any contribution to the action when you evaluate it on a supersymmetric configuration. Uh, if that's true, then you can find the classical solution by just extremizing only with the F terms. Okay. Uh, but okay, according to the solution in that found by that group, the VPS configurations are still generated by <coughs> two and plus two harmonic functions H. The scalars together with A hat are still determined in terms of the harmonic functions by equations that look structurally the same. Um, so before we had also fi and f bar i. Now the only difference is that the free potential depends on this new parameter. But we can use these two equations to solve for x as a function of of these harmonic functions. Um, so in this paper with with Himing and Samir, we generalize this new attractor mechanism to higher derivative corrections. And again, we want the metric to be regular and to have a simple zero in GDT, so that is we have a horizon with a, a non-vanishing temperature. And <clears throat> that, together with the stabilization equations, again, give us the same solution that at the north and south pole, either x bar is 0 or x is equal to 0. And the non-zero components are fixed in terms of their old attractor value given by this expression. So this is the old attractor, including high derivative corrections that people found before, but only applied at zero temperature. And well, again, I'm, I'm working with some normalization to make the formulas look simpler. That's, that's why there is a weird 64 here. Okay, the smoothness of the metric that comes from analyzing this vector omega is the same as before. Is not affected by high derivative corrections. So if we show that the high derivative corrections produce a non-zero value for this intersection product, then we are, we are good because now A, which is the denominator, will be determined as a function of the temperature and we will be able to pick whatever temperature we want. Um, um, yeah, and another comment is that the dipole found by, by, uh, by the smoothness of the solution, so how we split the total charge in these two, two centers, is again given in terms of the, the vector of, of attractor values, just like in the to derivative level with again, the, the clarification that these H stars now solve the new, the, now solve these equations with the, uh, including the A hat dependent. So the solution will be different than what we had for the to derivative level. And finally, the initial action is, is given by this expression. Um, okay, so we will use this one loop corrective prepotential, which comes from the heterotic string theory. So this is the three level one. And I wrote this for just a two vector multiplets because one can choose a duality frame where we only turn on a few charges. So this is just the simplest case. Uh, and this is the three, this, is, this would be the three level prepotential, uh, the two derivative one that if you would apply our methods, you will reproduce the solution that I explained in the beginning of the talk. And the only high derivative correction we need to incorporate is this one proportional to A hat, uh, this ratio of, of scalars. Um, uh, well, I put C here, well, C depends on, but there is a general formula for compactifications in more general spaces, but for this theory, this coefficient is one. Um, so now we can take this prepotential and evaluate the dipole charges and see whether the intersection product is, is zero or not. And we find that the intersection product is now non-vanishing and is given by the square root of n times w. So that's just, I'm just giving you the final answer. Otherwise, I wouldn't have time probably to go over the details, but I, I, you can ask me after the talk if you're interested. 
Um, this is enough. The important point is that this is enough to solve the three issues that we found earlier. So once this transaction product is non-zero, then the solution will be unique. Um, it will be smooth because now the, the scalars will be will be finite. And, and, and it will be present for any temperature we want. Uh, so this is, well, okay, I'm, I'm writing formulas where I just said, so the, if, if this term is non-zero, we can solve for A as a function of beta. Um, we can also look at <clears throat> the value of the dilaton at the north and south pole, and we see that it's non-zero. Um, still small because it's uh, it's small and it decays as at um, large charges increase the charges it becomes smaller but um, it's other than that it's everywhere finite and unbounded so finally we can use the solution to evaluate the gravitational path integral prediction for the index of this two charge system and we obtain this answer this four pi square root of NW that again exactly matches the microscopic analysis that we captured. Okay, so let me show a summary of what I think the picture is. <coughs> um, so if we're considering the thermal ensemble and you start with the black hole, uh, uh, large masses, and you reach extremality. Our proposal is that you will go through this winding condensate and its gas of strings. That's fine. And our proposal is that this high derivative corrective black hole is the answer to a different question, which is what is the index? And one way to, to say it is that before these recent developments, it wasn't understood how to distinguish these two calculations in gravity. Uh, back then, like I don't know, 20 years ago, whenever the the small black hole solution was found. But now that we understand how to set up the gravitational path integral for, for both, and we realize that they're different observables, we see that the, this rotating non-extremal BPS solution contributes to, to the index, but not to the thermal ensemble. Um, but let me emphasize that this is, I mean, this is not the same as the hard derivative solution that was found before. The one that was found before was found at zero temperature and uh, without the minus one to the F. Here we're finding it at any temperature you wish with the minus one to the F inserted. And in particular, the size of the horizon is not string. It can be as big as you want, depending on the, on the temperature. But it uses the same type of techniques that were used before for the small black hole solution. Okay, let me just finish. It's just a couple of minutes with yes. some comments. Um, so I started with this question, how does the gravitational path integral emerge from conventional string theory? So I think we found a setup where the thermal ensemble is described by, string, by strings, but the index is instead evaluated by a typical black hole geometry that you would use in, um, in, in for the big black hole, for example. Um, so I think it will be interesting to understand how to go between these two between these two des descriptions. Um, some open question is: Is there a self-gravitating solution, just like the horowitz polchinski that contributes to the index? So you got you could have asked um, in this picture as we uh, change the temperature. Why isn't there a winding condensate transition and a string gas? And the reason is that for this winding condensate, it's important the fact that the fermions are anti-periodic in the thermal circle, and we have this winding mode that is very light near the um, near extremality. Um, on the other hand, <clears throat> when you compute the index, the fermions are periodic in the thermal circle, and the usual GSO projection will will remove this winding condensate mode that that was the source of this horowitz polchinski solution. So that perhaps motivates why we expect the, the solution for the index to involve just the, the supergravity fields and the one in the thermal ensemble uh, can involve this winding condensate that, that is not there in the other observable. But having said that, this is just an uh, um, experiment 
expectation, but I don't know, there might be other, other stringy mode that becomes light that might lead to other more stringy solutions for the index. We don't know. I mean, if you want, we can think of this as um, uh, well, okay. Then, I mean, we. I cannot rule out the possibility of this existing. What I did was to take the solutions that we, we do know that are there and explain, which is the horowitz polchinski and the, uh, this non-extremal version of the small black hole and uh, propose a, a picture that is consistent with both perspectives. There might be other solutions, but uh, I don't know. At least, at least we don't need them to, to reproduce the index of this quadratic string. Okay, another question is, can we incorporate quantum corrections in the gravitational path integrals? So we reproduce the on shell action, but uh, there is a long program started by Ashok Sen of, of matching uh, logarithmic correction in the charges from the microscopic side to the black hole side, and, and it hasn't been achieved um, for the small black holes. So that would be, now that we have this, this geometry, one can try to reproduce them. Um, and finally, one can try to extend this to one charge black hole. For example, if we have a, a DC zero black hole in type 2A, um, that would be dual to the BFSS quantum mechanics, can we use the type 2A gravity to compute the index? Um, and in these cases, the solutions that we use doesn't seem to work because um, we find that <clears throat> uh, the string coupling at the horizon, instead of becoming zero, it becomes infinite. Um, so the, well, yeah, the, the supergravity approach that we took will, will work, but it would be interesting to, if there was uh, another resolution in that case. Okay, thank you for your attention. Is there another setup where you have such like a shell distinction? Story of the X computation, the one for example? Um, no, no, actually, that's is the only one I know. For example, in the big black hole, then here you just have the, the big extreme right horizon so northern black hole, and the two are connected as you take the, the temperature or not the temperature, sorry, the angular velocity from the supersymmetric value to zero, then the two are just connected by the kern Newman one, so they're the same solution in a way. In this case, the problem is that, uh, so I, I gave you an argument that that uses on this side just a subset of all the possible hard derivative corrections you could have, and it relies on supersymmetry, on these D terms not being important. So if I come here and I, and I take omega and I change it from this value to zero, let's say, then in principle, I, I don't know if I can, uh, I don't know if the solution we found survives once you go away from omega having the supersymmetric value. <clears throat> uh, so in that sense, it seems something special of the small black hole that the two are disconnected. Because in the big black hole, since the solution is there within the two derivative level, uh, you can just find it whatever, with or without supersymmetry, you can find it and go from one to another. Um, and regarding the quantum corrections, you mentioned, uh, so, so on what side? Uh, uh, ah, yeah, I mentioned, I mean here, yeah. Okay. Yeah, maybe I can also compute them in this side. Uh, but I was thinking of the type of calculation that I showed uh, did of computing the one loop determinants around the black hole geometry and then they give a, a computable contribution to uh, log area corrections. Corrections that are logarithmic in the uh, black hole area. Um, uh, well, it has been applied to a lot of big black holes and, and the microscopic index matches the, the black hole calculation of these logarithmic corrections. But as I know, it, it hasn't been applied to the small black hole. <clears throat> Uh, yeah, about the, the previous comment, it's important also that if I would try to use the small black hole for the thermal ensemble, then I would have really no argument that 
the calculation is under control because once you include some high relative corrections, you have to include all of them. And if you don't do it in a super symmetric way, then all the all the high relative terms can contribute and you cannot really control them. So um, from that point of view, it's also important that the solution we found is only valid uh, when you pick omega to have this special value. Other questions? Can you say again this assumption about the d terms being zero? Is this something you know is true in this case, or no? That's an assumption, but but <clears throat> check it. Uh, I think it's not. It's even not that easy to write them down uh, in general. Uh, people check them for check some of them, so you can write a couple. Uh, so what would they look like? I mean, um, uh, okay. well, in principle, you can have higher powers of R, for example. Here, these F terms will all be integrals of R squared times the gravity photon field strength to okay. some power. Uh, you will have R to the higher powers of R, for example. Um, so there was a paper of Samir Murthy and uh, Gupta, I think, where they write down some specific D terms and evaluate them on supersymmetric configurations and find that they vanish. There is no general proof that I know of. But you know that you get the correct uh, auction action, right? Um, yeah, yeah. It's, it's kind of yeah, yeah. consistent, at least. Yeah, it would be weird if, right. if, it, I don't know, <laughs> if this wasn't correct. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think this is an improvement in the sense that if you try to argue something like that here where you don't have supersymmetry, then that seems impossible to me. I wouldn't know even where to start from. But when you put it in the context of this supersymmetric observable in the right way, then it becomes some very sharp technical question of, of uh, the value of these details. Yeah. Questions? So the true, the That's right. Okay, then uh, let's thank you again for the best.